Hi, I'm Sarah Jaffe. I'm an executive producer at Penguin Random House Audio, and we are so excited to be kicking off our new series, Meet the Voice. And I couldn't be happier to be here with Shana Small, who is a narrator who I just admire so hard. I'm totally your fangirl. Hi, Shana. Hi. Uh, happy to be here. Um, is there anything you want to share with listeners who now, for the very first time, are also viewers? Yeah. Um... As you know, my name is Shana Small. I have been doing audiobooks for the past 10-ish years, um, and I'm also an actress, I'm a musician, and I am a producer as well. I didn't know you were a producer. I'm a producer for uh, short films and for like small, it's a, bur a burgeoning thing right now, so it's a, a new title that I'm owning and adding onto my multi-hyphenated, you know. I love it. Yeah. It's like a like the most amazing um choo choo train set. I know. Right? Like the worst metaphor, but <laughs> I'm into add, it. it. <laughs> add another boxcar. I love yeah. it. Um I'm probably gonna pick your brain off about that off camera because I'm like super yeah. curious. But we're here to talk about audio. Um and I'm glad that you, you know, introduced right off the bat that you're also a musician. Um I I'm always curious when I get to talk to actors who are also musicians who make their way into audiobooks because mm. I think when it's a medium that's really only using sound, I think there's something really cool about bringing a, mus uh, a musician's ear to it. Yeah, um, Is that something that you've connected? Well, I'll say I'm, I think the easiest part of starting audiobooks is that I already had the equipment <laughs> to jump into it. So I was like, I'll just use it for this. Um, but I, one of the things I love about audio is that it is an, an uh, it is the same sort of medium. And I think the things that I found myself attracted to when I was listening to audiobooks or some of my favorite audiobook narrators uh, is the quality of their voice and the story that can be told through just like inflection or tone, I find that really fascinating. Um, so it was a nice transition for me to hear how that there's a musicality as well in a uh, great audiobook uh, production and projects. I'll pr I'm gonna ask you a bunch more questions about audio, but before we even get there, like I wanna back up a minute and, cause I don't, I don't know this, um, how you got into acting and performing and what, what made you decide to become an actress? Yeah. Ooh. I always say, and people laugh at this, but I always say that my introduction into like theater or uh, I guess like oratorial, the practice of like oral, oratorial, uh, whatever the word is, was church. So both of my parents are musicians. Um, my father is a composer and my mother is a singer. And they were for a long time um, responsible for the music of uh, various churches that they traveled to. And so I had the opportunity to kind of be behind the scenes, but also uh, I was in church a lot. So I you know, at a young age, had to find different ways to stay entertained or to, like, keep my attention. Um, and I was so fascinated by pastors and how they were able to command uh, huge audiences with their voice. And uh, and then also my grandmother was a Bible study teacher. And I, uh, I found her so fascinating. She was so good at telling stories and like, you know, we were a bunch of rowdy kids, but she was so, her command of speech and the way that she was able to keep us enraptured was mesmerizing to me. And I think that was the, the through line between me wanting to tell stories. Um, so that was my beginning of, of acting. That's so cool. Yeah. I'm so glad. I'm, I'm so glad you, I don't know that that that's your inroad too, because I always I've always seen a real connection between teaching and you know church. Obviously, it has the has the same thing in even a bigger way because it's so much you know in some ways it's more formal in some ways it's less formal. But mm -hmm. um, you know when I think about religious leaders or really teachers, which in a way are like my personal religious leaders, um, that you have to hold a room in a way that you know we think of actors or performers or people whose uh, charisma is really used to like 
I don't know, for entertainment as being the only people who have that, but there are like everyday performers among us all the time. All the time. Your uncle that has the best jokes at the, at the cookout, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Definitely. Yes. That's so cool. Um, and, um, you, am I, am I remembering correctly that you went to Juilliard? So you decided pretty mm-hmm. young that this was going to be your path. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, uh, well, before I got to Juilliard, I went to a performing arts high school, which actually I think was the best preparation I could have for Juilliard. It was in Baltimore. It's called Baltimore School for the Arts. Yeah, right after that, I moved to New York. I went to Juilliard. And I think I was 17 when I got there in the oh, middle wow. of New York City. Oh, my God. <laughs> Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah, that was those first four years in New York. Learning the the building blocks of of acting and and theater. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. So from there, how did you make your way to audio? I my my senior year, I think it was my senior year of of school. A friend of mine knew a friend who was starting a an audiobook production company. Um, and didn't know anything about audiobook production, but he was into music and he, I think he managed uh, a couple of uh, rap groups at the time. So they had the equipment again, like that transition in between <laughs> music and audiobook production. Um, so he needed some actors. I was there. I gave it a try and that was probably horrible, but uh, I thankfully used some pseudonyms so that I, <laughs> no one will know <laughs> the progression. Um, and it took a while for me to understand it because I didn't really know much about it uh, graduating from school. I think at the time, there wasn't a, there was definitely audio books and audio book production companies out at the time, but I, I don't think it was nearly as widespread as it is now. Um, you know, we definitely didn't have, I think smartphones were still, like happening while I was still graduating from school. So no one had the app of, uh, you know, to be able to download these, these books for themselves. But it was around, around then when I first got my feet wet. That's so cool. I think I got into audio actually around the exact same time. And it was a similar thing of like, what is this? It was sort of before smartphones and before podcasting and before everyone was listening to everything all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I think now... I mean, as that's gotten more popular, and I think now in this particular COVID-19 moment where we're all stuck at home, I think there's a lot of actors who are really curious about audiobooks because it's kind of the only form of acting that you get to do from your home or any other windowless box. And you don't have to have sets or costumes. You don't have to have any physical contact, but you can create this whole world. I think if you're if you're acting, you have this whole separate thing where it's not just I'm at work, I'm not at work. You go also from like I'm me to I'm this other person or an audio. Often you get to be these other people multiple on the same project. Um, and I'm this is I'm so excited that we get to have this um, interview right now because this is just a question I would have wanted to ask you normally off camera. I'm listening to The Vanishing Half by Brett Bennett right now, which you narrated. I actually just finished it. I shouldn't say listening. I should say I just listened. It was so good. Um, And your narration on that is so incredible because it's this this third person narration that takes that follows a family through, you know, multiple generations and multiple locations. And there's all kinds of characters. And your narration is so good that I forgot that I was listening to an audiobook, which like I listen to audiobooks for work. I work with audiobooks. Like I, how should I be able to forget that I'm listening mm. to an actor performing? But it just felt like, oh, this story is just like appearing in front of me in my kitchen as I'm making dinner and like I'm going about my life, but I'm also like in this other world. Um, and your character voices are really good and your storytelling is really incredible. Um, and we could have 20 minutes of me just praising you. But my actual question is like, how do you, how do you prepare for your character work? And how to, and including, I think, even the narrator, like, I think it's easy to forget that the narrator, even if it's an omniscient sort of bird's eye narrator, is kind of a character too. Like, how mm. do you shape that? Mm, it's changed over a lot uh, these past few years. I've also been learning, like, I'm learning as I'm doing it. Uh, and I think 
the through line for me has always been to approach it as an actor and not to judge any of the characters, um, which it can be easy to do when you have material where there's a, a very clear villain. Um, but Britt Bennett is so uh, expertly able to draw these three-dimensional characters. There's no real villain. I think everyone has their own villain, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's more about the character themselves in conflict with themselves, which is different than there being, like, a clear nemesis and, you know, the protagonist and antagonist. Um, So I'd say that the first thing I do is understanding what everyone is fighting against in themselves and uh, what their inner conflict is. That's been super helpful Um, because even the villain has you know, multiple layers. And I, I, it's so much easier when you have a writer who's brilliant. You, she's like doing the heavy lifting for me. I'm like, oh, great. Now I get to just <laughs> say the words. Uh, so yeah, having empathy for the characters. Um, and then reading the book a couple of times. Like, I guess that, that would seem to be obvious, but uh you know, reading it the first time to understand what's happening and then piecing back through it for me has often been helpful. Um, Scott Brick, uh, who is an amazing, uh, amazing narrator, has some session. On, I listened to a podcast that he he was uh, guest appearing on and he was talking about how the narrator voice, there's different types of narrators. There's like the first person narrator, second person narrator, but like that there's a certain proximity that they have to the listener. Um, And I think identifying where that narrator lives, is it more personal? Is it like further away? That's been super helpful in how I approach it. Um, Whether the narrator has a point of view about what's happening. So... Did I answer that question? I don't know if I did. (laughs) I think you did. I think you did. And I think like sort of what was um, implicit in your answer too is that it's like, it's not the same approach to every book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found that depending on how well I know the author, like there are those authors that you do, a narrator might narrate a series of books uh, and you understand their voice. So like the next book becomes like a little bit easier to approach and like it changes based off of the style of the book or the genre of the book, definitely. Mm-hmm. Nonfiction versus fiction and, you know, how you prepare for that is vastly different. Um, well, maybe not vastly, but for, for me, it feels a little different. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a difference between like a history book and a fantasy book. Like those are those are very different prep. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> 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 a little bit. For one, you don't have... You're not voicing, you know, 14, 15 characters for for the history book. Uh, But the narrator for nonfiction has to be voicing the excitement and the passion of the author. You know, you are the voice of of the author. Yeah. Yeah. It's is it a is it a conscious choice? And maybe I'm like loading this question because I know that you have a music background like when you, for the, in The Vanishing Half, for example, like you were doing pitch perfect dialogue for like men, women, people of all different ages, people of different races. Do you pick consciously like where in your register someone's voice is going to land or does that just feel really organic or are you like, oh, this person, you know, is going to have kind of a head voice. This person's going to have a chest voice. This person might, you know, like where, where, where do I pitch it? Is that something you think about or just something that the character comes out that way? I'm usually not thinking about the the pitch of the voice so much as their point of view and their perspective in the world and like how I think that person would carry their body. So the twins that are in this book, uh, it was tricky because, you know, you have two people that are identical, but they're very much, they're worlds apart, literally <laughs> worlds apart. <laughs> and how they carry themselves. So one character aspires to be uh, in a white world or like white adjacent at least. Uh, And so that feels different like in your body. And I, 
one of the things I try to do is bring my full body to every character that I'm doing um, because it changes based off of who they are. And I think when we think about voiceover, we think that we can't move or we can't be in a studio. We must be still, but it's so important for me to like ha find my feet on the ground and change the position based off of who they are. I generally like my legs automatically start getting wider as I become male characters just because in general men take up a little bit more space so I have to sit differently or um and then it ends up happening. I I try to avoid pitching my voice down low when I'm doing the male characters because it just doesn't read authentic. Um and again I'm still learning. I'm I am not at all a vet so I I'm taking these notes from, you know, Scott Brick, from Robin Miles, from, which I should have mentioned earlier, Robin Miles also teaches. She's amazing. She's yeah. great. Um, and Dion Graham. But that's, that's where I try to approach it in that vein. When you were getting to audio, did you, is there like a piece of advice that sticks out um, that you were given when you got into audio or really when you were 17 and starting to really become serious as an actor? Um that has sort of shaped how you how you view that work there is and <clears throat> funny enough like it was the same note when I was 17 that I got like a couple of months ago but I wasn't able to hear it in the same way I think a lot of actors go through different transitions in their artistic development so you're young you have this passion for something, you go to school, you learn how to do, act, like, you know, what, what these fundamentals are of theater. And sometimes you end up losing, I, I can speak for myself, I ended up losing uh, the authenticity of my own voice. Uh, not on purpose, I don't, they, they don't intend to do that. I think you're learning how to do different things and you're stretching your instrument. And part of uh, becoming an artist is like, putting those two things back together, the training and then who you are um, and what you bring naturally that no one else can bring. No one else has your voice. And so one of the things that I'm learning right now is that marriage between the training that's there and we don't have to like think about it anymore. And like, that's going to happen automatically and who I am, like, what is my perspective? What am I bringing that no one else is going to bring? And that's, mostly just about being comfortable with myself. So I, I would say authenticity is probably the biggest thing that I, you know, I'm learning and that I could offer for other people that are getting into it to learn. I think that's amazing advice. And I think it's so true that, you know, I, can't, I, I imagine that something that requires, anything really that requires confidence is really hard to take in when you're 17. And that, you know, life will give you something to chew on and then later it'll come back and you're like, oh, I can get something else out of this now. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, you know, 17, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know who I was yet. How could I? It's still changing and hopefully it's always changing. But yeah, that's a big one. Authenticity. Right. Last question, sort of jumping up off of authenticity. Um, and sort of when you think about like, what's, what's one unique thing I can bring, um, when I'm voicing characters and I'm telling stories, I think audio is a really interesting medium, like not only just because you can do it in a little box all by yourself and create this whole big world, but, um, you know, it's also, it's, it's, it's also funny that you mentioned that you have to change out of your pajamas because often actors love audio because you can roll into the booth in sweatpants and you like can't do that for other jobs. Um, it's true. <laughs> but, um, but audio, I think, also gives you a lot of leeway because it's all about how expressive your voice is and what you can do with your voice and all the other things about acting. Like, your physicality is there, but only you know it. Like, is, is there any story you would want to tell or character that you would want to get to portray that you feel like audio would be the your your ideal way to do it? Like, maybe a character that, for whatever reason, might might not mm. be within, like, your range in other mediums? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I mean, my first thought was actually, <laughs> I don't know if she'd be out, out of my range, but I think she's a fascinating character. Um, Margaret Garner. She, for those who don't, might not know, was um, 
an enslaved woman who had children and instead of having them being born into slavery thought it better for her to take their lives instead of like continuing the cycle of slavery i just think that's a you know i guess and i say that because i i also when i hear certain books like a, a sort of soundtrack that they might not have had at all in mind kind of plays in my head about what these people are, what kind of music they might be listening to. And I think Margaret Garner's soundtrack has to be insane, you know, like what sonically is happening in her life and her head to make such a hard decision like that. Um, I find that fascinating. Yeah. That and who else? Would, uh, Janelle Monae. <laughs> I think she's <laughs> I just want to hear what's happening like what's going on in here to make such amazing things it's very opposite yeah very spectrum, opposite but... but both fascinating I would yeah. listen to both of those I would listen yeah. to you do both of those um I think I think that might be it for our big questions I don't know is there anything else that you I don't know wanted to get to talk about or wanted to say or wanted to ask me or anything mm. oh I, yeah I can ask you a question Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I think I'm, what, I'm ready. as a producer, because you've listened to like tons and tons of audiobooks, I think this might be interesting for like actors that are interested in getting into uh, audiobook work. What is it that you're drawn to? Like, what do you hear? And um, what things do you wish that other actors could like focus on or get excited about? Oh, that's such a good question. That's such a good question. Yeah. Um, it is. Well, because I think if I had to boil it down, I think it's really the same thing that you, that you keep in mind, which is authenticity. And that looks different for every actor. But I think there's a big difference when I'm listening to someone and they only have one tool to tell me a story and that's their voice. Mm -hmm. And so I want, I want to be with them. Like I want them to, to be so sure of what they are saying and not in a way where they're, and you know, it depends on the book too. Like there's some books where you, 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 you just do want to read it to the listener. But what I'm most impressed by, I think is when someone's voice can just carry me through a story and I trust them and I'm willing to go anywhere with them. Um, and I think that really does boil down to authenticity. I think that is, um, the ability to be a really keen reader and figure out like, okay, here's, here's the through line of this story. Here's where to hold back on the tension. Here's where to push it through with a lot of momentum. Um, and to, to sort of let the, the book shine, which is always easier with a really good book, but a really good mm -hmm. actor can make an okay book into a really good book on mm -hmm. audio. Um, and I think I look for that quality. And I think I think I like voices that sound like real people to me. Mm. Um, I like voices that have a little bit of texture to them or that um, are really elastic and expressive. Like you can just hear a really small shift of feeling in just a really s subtle way. Um, and, you know, there's also actors who I really like who have really beautiful, clean, smooth voices. Um, and they're great, too. But I think the, the I'll, I'll often get stopped in my tracks by a voice that um, that feels like really the only kind of voice that could tell whatever story it is. And there's all kinds of voices that fit the bill. I don't I don't know if that is a really esoteric answer or not. No, I thought it was great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us and for chatting with me. I really yeah, enjoyed really. this yeah. um, and getting to know you better. And I hope I hope listeners have too.